Are you familiar with the definition of diabetes and prediabetes? Technically, a hemoglobin A1C of 5.7 to 6.4 is prediabetes, and a hemoglobin A1C above 6.4 corresponds to diabetes. So does that mean a hemoglobin A1C of 5.6 and below are all the same and normal? Or is any gradation or increase in hemoglobin A1C of concern, and do you want that to be as low as possible? I'm Dr. Brett Scher, the medical director at dietdoctor.com, and there are two new studies that shed a little bit of light on this. The first focusing on hemoglobin A1C, and the second on the, the concept of, of uh, overweight and metabolically healthy. So let's take these each individually. Just because a disease is defined with a certain cutoff doesn't mean that if you're just below that cutoff, you're perfectly fine, right? The, in medicine, we have to pick cutoff points for diagnoses, codes, reimbursements, um, medication approvals, things like that. But it doesn't mean that the lack of a disease is the definition of health. I'm going to say that again. It doesn't mean that not having a disease means you are healthy. That is not the case at all. And now we have even more evidence to show this. So the first study published in the Journal of American College of Cardiology looked at almost 4,000 people without diabetes. So they had to have prediabetes or quote unquote normal blood sugar based on hemoglobin A1C. They also didn't have any known vascular disease. And what they did in this study was uh, people were measured for subclinical atherosclerosis. So meaning they weren't having angina, they didn't have heart attacks or strokes, but they did ultrasounds of the carotid and the abdominal aorta, and they did calcium scores. And then they correlated their findings with hemoglobin A1Cs. And what they found wasn't a surprise, really. The higher your hemoglobin A1C, the higher the risk of having subclinical atherosclerosis. With the highest A1C group, between 6.1 and 6.4%, having an odds ratio of 2.47 of being more likely to have subclinical atherosclerosis in multiple areas um, and severity of the subclinical atherosclerosis. As the A1Cs trended down, so did that odds ratio. But here's the important point. The odds ratio was still statistically significant, even at the range of 5.5 to 5.6. So that is considered, quote unquote, see my air quotes, normal hemoglobin A1C, but yet there was still a statistically significant increased risk of subclinical atherosclerosis, even at that normal level. Then as you go below the 5.5, it was no longer statistically significant, but it was sort of a linear trend. As the A1C dropped, so did the risk of subclinical atherosclerosis, even though it was just a trend. You know, lower, fewer number of people at that level, smaller differences, maybe not power to detect a difference. But here's what I think is such the, is the interesting take home. This is just really shows very clearly just because a line has to be drawn in the sand somewhere to say above X is di is a disease and below X is not. That doesn't mean just below that number, you're perfectly fine. It's not an absolute cutoff point, but it is a gradual increased risk and gradation that you have to be aware of. So the reason this comes up is because if you go get your hemoglobin A1C checked, your doctor says it's 5.5 or 5.6, and they say you're normal. Does that mean you don't need to worry about your blood sugar at all? I would argue definitely not. Now, a couple faults of this study, right? It's subclinical atherosclerosis. So it's not measuring heart attacks or strokes or people dying. It's measuring buildup of plaque. So it's not as good of an endpoint, but it's also a much easier endpoint to measure. That way you don't need 10 or 20 year study with tens of thousands of people. Instead, you can do a shorter study with fewer numbers of people. So it makes sense, but still, um, you would like to reduce your risk of subclinical atherosclerosis. It makes sense. Second is, as with a lot of observational studies like this, there were other confounding variables. So the higher the A1C, the less healthy people were at baseline, but that difference really started to shrink as you got into the lower A1C levels, including that 5.5 to 5.6 level. The next issue is that A1C is not a perfect measure by any means, right? It, it assumes your red blood cells live three months. It assumes it's going to be the same for everybody, that the absolute cutoff point is the same for everybody, and that's just not the case. A1C can be helpful to trend over time um, as an absolute cutoff for an individual 
is less helpful. But when you have 4,000 people, chances are that's going to come out in the wash and it's going to be pretty representative in that type of a population setting. Now, here's what I find so interesting. In the conclusion part of this paper, they talk about how we should be more aware of A1Cs at lower levels and possibly intervention um, at lower levels of A1C to reduce it further, to reduce subclinical atherosclerosis. And there's a big paragraph talking about this with one sentence devoted to lifestyle. One sentence devoted to the utility of lifestyle for reducing hemoglobin A1C, preventing prediabetes, lowering A1C to even a lower normal level. One sentence. The rest of this huge paragraph was all about medications, about GLP-1 agonists, about SGLT-2 inhibitors, drugs, drugs, drugs. And look, it's not that the drugs aren't helpful. They certainly have a role and can be helpful, but I think this just perfectly highlights where we are today in our medicine culture, our drug-focused medicine culture, with one sentence to lifestyle and a huge paragraph to drugs. I would have turned this around and say, if you've got an A1C of 5.5 to 5.6, it is time to seriously investigate your nutrition, your exercise, your sleep, your stress, your whole lifestyle to see how you can bring that down even further. Because even though you don't have prediabetes, that is too high. The other thing I would mention is now we have even better technology. So throw out the A1C, get a CGM. Let's see what a continuous glucose monitor shows because then you can see glycemic variability, how high and how low are the excursions of glucose and what is the average over time. That's even better data um, that I think once we get studies like this using CGM, we'll see that even at lower levels, well below what would correspond to an A1C of 5.5 or 5.6, we'll see subclinical atherosclerosis. We'll see higher risk uh, of clinical events, but we need better data from that. But from an individual standpoint or for a clinician, I'd say throw a CGM on your patients and, and monitor them for better data that way. Now, the second study I wanted to mention that's sort of along these same lines was published in Diabetes Care. And what this looked at was the difference between people who are overweight and metabolically healthy or unhealthy or normal weight and different you know, variations of that. And what is the risk of cardiovascular events? So again, this is an observational study. This is a retrospective observational study of over 9,000 people. And basically what they found was metabolically healthy obese patients had a lower risk of cardiovascular events than metabolically unhealthy normal weight patients. So I thought that was interesting, right? So you can be obese but if you meet their criteria for metabolically healthy, your risk is lower than normal weight metabolically unhealthy. So clearly metabolic health is more important than weight itself. But even the metabolically healthy obese patients still had an increased risk of having cardiovascular events. Of course, the worst was the group that was metabolically unhealthy and obese. That had the worst correlation with increased risk of cardiovascular events. And they use sort of the standard metabolic syndrome definition of metabolically healthy, which again, just like with that hemoglobin A1C study, just because you don't have triglycerides of 150 or a waist circumference of 40, right? Doesn't mean you're good. Triglycerides of 149 and a waist circumference of 39 centimeters is not great. So even though that might not mean metabolic dysfunction based on those definitions, that's not your goal. That's not what you should be shooting for. So I think this study shows a couple of things. One, it's not all about the weight, it's about the metabolic health. But even with not having a diagnosis of metabolic syndrome, that doesn't mean you're in the clear because it's still a range and you wanna be lower on that range. How low? That's hard to say, right? If your triglycerides are less than 70, if your waist to, to height ratio is less than 0.5, those are all great. Um, but it doesn't mean you have to be there to be healthy. But clearly, the lower down you get on those, on those ranges, the healthier you get overall. Um, so there is a correlation. So the main take home to sum it all up is don't accept that you are healthy, you're normal, just because you don't have disease. These things are a continuum. We can learn better. We have better techniques like CGMs, better than A1Cs. We have better goals than just not having metabolic syndrome, but actually being metabolically healthy. So you can, you can have this knowledge to help you target your lifestyles to try and achieve better metabolic health. And also the other take home is the study from Jack summed it up perfectly that it's such a drug focused medical community and we really should be 
much more of a lifestyle focused medical community to define a lifestyle that people enjoy, that they can stick with, and that is actually effective at improving metabolic health. So we have resources at dietdoctor.com to help you find a lifestyle that will work for you, whether it's a low carb lifestyle, a keto lifestyle, a liberal low carb lifestyle, a high protein lifestyle. We've got some exercise guides, all of that to get you started to help improve your lifestyle today and help you improve your health today. Thanks a lot, everybody. Make sure you click subscribe and give us a thumbs up and a comment uh, that'll help other people find this video. And you can see more from us in the future here on Diet Doctor News on YouTube. Thanks a lot. Thank mm-hmm. you.